Well, I just want to welcome everybody that's watching online, and we're glad that you're here. I want to welcome everybody in the Connect room that's uh, just sitting back and relaxing and enjoying the service with us today. Uh, first time guest, a special welcome to you. My name is Pastor James, and we're kicking off a new series called Parenting Principles. And as I roll into this, you know, a lot of things are happening. It, of course, it kicks off uh, National Law Enforcement Week. So a shout out to all those that serve in law enforcement as this week we honor you. And then tomorrow, history is going to be made. And the U.S. Embassy will be opening in Jerusalem uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Now, the significance of that, not that it needs the validation of the United States, because God has always called Israel uh, his country, his nation, his people. And Jerusalem, uh, be, well before the Roman Empire, Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. And so it, it's just a validation, I guess. Those who stand with Israel, it says, uh, pray for the peace of Israel. So we want to be praying for the peace of Israel. And, and it says, those that uh, bless, he will bless. Those that curse, he will curse. So we want to be a blessing to Israel. And uh, it's going to be a great day. It will be a day you will want to watch TV as history is unfolded. So keep that in your prayers. Well, we're in this series called Parenting. We're kicking it off. It's Mother's Day, right? And we're going to do this series for Mother's Day and run it right through Father's Day. Now, with parenting, it really affects more people than ever before because in this, I'm going to touch on the grandparent role. A lot of grandparents are raising grandkids today, uh, but even if you're blessed and you're empty nesters like Eileen and I, and the grandkids come, you sugar them up, you hug them, you send them home, you know, I'll, uh, you still play an important part as the patriarch of the family, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Today, I want to just kind of lay a foundation for you because uh, a lot of parents are just overwhelmed and they, they, they want to do their best. They just don't feel equipped. They don't know how. And so they're just kind of taking different elements from culture and society and they're just trying to make things work. And so we really want to kind of bring to you biblical principles with this. Uh, I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned on, on raising children came from our dog trainer. So here, here you go. I'm going to give you some wisdom that's theologically sound from a dog trainer. And, uh, and, and really, our boys, are just a little bit of our history, we have three boys. They've all, they're all grown. We're empty nesters. They're all in their mid and upper 20s. It's amazing to go upper 20s now. So the fact that we have a kid that's, that's chasing on 30 is amazing. We've got uh, all three of our boys married beautiful women. Uh, so we have three amazing daughter-in-laws. We have I'm going to just say three grandsons because one's due this week. So we've got three grandkids, and I'm telling you, life is rich. Uh, life is amazing, and, and we want to show you how to get there. Uh, we, we've got our record in the record books. Um, our life, we want to be a testimony of the principles of God that, that we have used to raise our family, and the principles of God are not a respecter of man. The principles of God work whomever applies the principles of God. And it's really easy to say, that, well, you know, we've, we've been dealt a hand, it's a unique circumstance. The principles of God are true, and the principles of God work. And, and all I did, Eileen and I, is we applied these principles. And the principle that I was referring to that was evident by our dog trainer is we had, we had three remarkable kids, but we could not raise a dog. <laughs> and uh, I'm a dog lover. Um, and so uh, there, there's no point of having a cat because you can't train a cat. But a dog, on the other hand, you know, a dog, on the other hand, is man's best friend. And so we had this dog, and his name was George. And I fancied myself as kind of a dog whisperer. We grew up with dogs in our family. Um, it was kind of my dad's style of the alpha male that kind of worked in raising kids. It worked in raising dogs. But George could not, it was a code that could not get cracked. And uh, George, the only thing that saved George for as long as he, uh, it did was he was adorable. But there was a point where George just wasn't that cute. And so <laughs> we, we said, you know, I tried everything. And finally we said, let's get this dog trader to, to come. And so her, her name was Nancy, and she actually came to the house. 
And I've seen the TV show with the dog whisperer, and so I'm like, this is going to be great. We're going to pay Nancy 40 bucks. She's going to take our dog, bring him back in two hours. Bam, we got, a, we got a family member, and this dog behaves, right? Well, the doorbell rang. George starts barking, so that was embarrassing already because you wanted the dog to behave so you could have some respect as the owner, right? And the dog's barking. I know the dog's not supposed to bark. We open the door, and the dog is jumping all over the dog trainer, which is strike two. I know the dog isn't supposed to jump. So I'm embarrassed and humiliated already that I've obviously have failed by the actions of my dog. I have failed as an owner. And I think a lot of parents feel this way when they get out in public. There's embarrassment that comes by the behavior of the kids, and so they try to overcompensate with that embarrassment. And so D George is jumping up and down, and George is still barking. George is a happy dog that will not listen to anybody. And, and so th I thought that the, the dog trainer was going to take the dog and train the dog. And so I kind of give her a little history of the dog, and I said, now, do you want us to leave? Um, are you going to take George? What, what do you want to do? Here, here's my broken dog. Fix him. <laughs> And there's 40 bucks. Give me back a good dog, okay? And that can be the mentality with parenting. You know, I, I, there's just something wrong. I'm just going to drop them off at youth group. I'm going to drop them off at baseball or I'm going to drop them off at sports. And you fix them and give them back to me. And, and, and you know, we, we kind of run in this cycle. And, and real quick, I realized that I wasn't going anywhere. And she goes, oh, no, 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 no. You need to stay here. And I thought, okay, I'll just watch what you do. And I, I'm going to mimic. Well, we soon quit discuss, discussing George's uh, behavior, and we soon began talking about how I was acting around George. And, and the focus was turned to me. Well, you do this, you're not supposed to do that. And you do this, and you're not supposed to do that. Be, by my behavior, I was elevating George to be the master of the house. You know, I love George. George got to sit wherever George wanted. I rubbed in George's belly. You know, George was, it was, literally, I could have, I could have been more wrong in how to react to this dog than what I was doing. Because every time I did something, she goes, no, 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 you don't want to do that. No, no, you don't want to do that. No, no, you don't want to do that. I'm paying 40 bucks to have this waved in my face. <laughs> going, you don't want to do that. And, I'm, and I began to realize the problem was not with George. The problem was with me. And that if she could change my behavior, then George's behavior would change. And it was really a moment that I realized this is what parenting is. That, that it's not the behavior of the child that needs to be addressed, it's the way the parent is responding. That if we change the way we act in a situation, and if we take the lead, then the child's behavior will change and follow. It, it, it's proven every time. And that's biblical principles. And so here are some different styles of parenting. And I want you to realize where, where the emphasis is going to be. There, there was, in America, there was the authoritarian uh, style of parenting. I, I kind of came in at the end of that. I'm a baby boomer. I'm 1964, so I'm right at the end of one, right at the beginning of the other. And, but I was still, there was still elements of the authoritarian. My poor brother grew up in the authoritarian. And that is might makes right, do it because I said so or else. And the or else was the motivation <laughs> to do the right thing. And, and so it was an authoritarian, and, and it, was about, it was all about behavior modification. It was all about behaving, and it was about um, just discipline and, and correction and punishment. But when you did wrong and you stepped out of line, uh, Dad let you know. And you did things because Dad said so. And, and I would go, why? And my dad would go, because I said so. And then I learned not to say why afterwards, because there was an or else that came along with it. Then we went into a new phase, a new style, and it was an overcompensation to the authoritarian, and that was the permissive parenting style. Permissive parenting style is a style that y the parent wants to be the child's friend. And they will do, they'll do whatever they can to be the child's friend. It is to overwhelm them with affirmation and, and, uh, and love and affection, positive affirmation. You know, love and affection are good, but it operates from the principle that children are at their core basically good. <laughs> 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 
the ones with parents know that ain't right, right? See, the authoritarian realized, well, at the core, the child's bad. And so my dad just assumed uh, if we weren't doing something wrong, we were up to doing something wrong. And so that, you know, it was a total paradigm shift. I remember my parents would go away on vacation. We, we were old enough to stay home. My brothers and sisters were teenagers, and they'd always say, we'll be back on the 18th, but you can bet dad was coming back on the 15th. Why? Because we were doing something wrong. That was the, po- that was the policy. And so, uh, so, so this one is where this, the, the permissive style is where everybody gets a trophy. We want to protect feelings. We want to, yeah, I grew up in the area era where we earned trophies uh, and we didn't have seat belts. This was before bike helmets. I mean, <laughs> we turned out okay, we lived. But, but this is a, a culture of, of um, protection, uh, of, of affirmation, of if I just encourage them enough, I can encourage them through and out of any behavior. And, and really you see where, where the challenge becomes is when the focus is to being the friend of the child rather than being the parent of the child. And you've got all these different cultures and all these different things that are competing and, and you've got parents that today's parents are living in one culture and their grandparents are trying to give them insight into another culture. But the third one is where I want to focus on in this series and that is uh, a biblical style of parenting. And the Bible actually has many guidelines and how to parent. You know, in, 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 my, in my lifetime, and I speak for Eileen too, we, we've seen amazing things in our lives. But with all of our kids raised, I, I've got to say that parenting is the most rewarding element of life. Um, I've got to say that nothing's been more challenging in my life than parenting. But nothing is more fulfilling and rewarding than to see the call of God come to pass in all of your children's lives and to know that God used you as a parent to help lead and guide them. And biblical principles is about training a child. It's more than just raising a child. It's about training a child. In fact, the Bible says to it, it is bringing up a child where you're writing the principles of God upon their hearts. And the goal is this, is that when they start making their own decisions, the litmus test on how well you trained them up is will they make godly choices? Do they put their trust in God? Do they follow God through the circumstances of life? And, and so biblical principles it isn't correction. It isn't, uh, you know, just affirmation. It is, it is training up a child in the way he should go. So when he is old, he won't part from it. And so we want to show you elements of how to train up your children over the next few weeks. And some of you have teenagers. We're gonna, you're going to be able to apply. We're going to start in the early ages, and, and you might be going, well, it's too late for us. We've got a 13-year-old that's out of control or, or something. You might be saying we have an 18 or 21-year-old. I'm, I'm telling you, one lesson that I've learned over the last couple of years is your job's never done as a parent. And there's biblical principles on how to parent an adult child too. And here's what I, I, I need to tell you, spoiler alert. The way you parent an adult child is different than the way you parent a four-year-old. Just giving you a heads up, parents. There's some changes that are going on. There, there is some changes, but, but as a patriarch of the family, you can have that influence that continues well into, uh, into their adulthood. So here, if you're taking notes, here's a couple of principles I'm going to give you today. I'm gonna, hopefully we're going to have time to go through three principles today. The first principle is this, is it starts at the top. Man, this is what I figured out when the dog trainer came is that it wasn't the dog we were going to deal with. It was going to be me we were going to deal with. It's not the child. It starts with at the top. It starts with the parent. And, and so many times that can be a source of frustration because it's hard to look at yourself in the mirror. It's hard to say, okay, I've done some things wrong and I've got to change my behavior. I've got to change the way I, I look at parenting. But the reality is as soon as we can get the parents to adopt some biblical principles, we'll see the change in a child just like that. And if they're, if they're under five, if they're under eight, the change can be as quick as 20, 48 hours. I mean, when they're little, it is real quick. When we, when we teach parents principles, biblical principles, we'll see in, in a children within two days, three days, we'll see significant behavioral changes. And so the first thing is to realize this. The problem is not with the children or the challenge is not with the children. 
the challenges with us as parents. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, notice some of the things I have underlined. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, uh, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with all your heart. I'm going to look. It's underlined. Awesome. And it says, Love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. So once we even put those upon our hearts first, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your, ho of your houses and of your gates. And so what's interesting, when we were in Israel, uh, at every home, they have a, like a tube that they actually have this scripture written and they nail it to the door frame. So literally when it says put these laws on every door frame, it's literally on every door frame at every hotel room that you walk through as a reminder that the principles of God begins with us first and that we are to impart them to our children. Let me put it this way. The photocopy is only as good as the original. When, when when I was going to speak on parenting uh, a while back, we, we asked all of our kids, we called our kids, and we said, okay, what, what are some things we did right? Because to be honest with you, we, to some degree, felt like we were just lucky. We got lucky. But it was really hard work. It was very intentional. But we asked them, so what did we do right from your perspective? We have a good idea of what I'm going to say, but I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, growing up in the home, what did we do right? All three kids said the exact same thing without knowing what the other said. And this is what they said. You guys were the same people at home as you were at church. So what you see on Sunday, pray for my boys, they had to live with their whole life. <laughs> You're going, Lord, that is grace. They turned out the way they did. So, uh, but but it, was, it was that consistency. It was integrity in who we were, in what we said, and what we did that we always told our kids it wasn't because I was a pastor, because I, they, they were in their teens, or uh, uh, my oldest was a teenager, and the others were approaching teens before I went into ministry. We just always said, we do this because we're Christians. And, and so we, we just said, this is what a biblical life is all about. But notice how many times the references to the parent as, as the adult, before you teach these principles, you need to take these principles. You need to strengthen your faith in Christ. That's why it's important to make your faith a priority. That's why we, in our household, we knew where we were going to be every Sunday. I knew that I had to be filled with the presence of God if I was going to be a good parent and pass that to my kids. I knew that there was going to be challenges at work with schedules and demands on our time, that those demands were going to be on our kids' times, and that it was even going to escalate and get worse as they got older. And I wanted to show them that with all the demands that were on our lives when I was in the corporate world, when I was self-employed, that, that Dad always made his faith in God a priority. And so I'm telling you, we were busy, and we were running crazy. But every Sunday morning, we were in church. And it wasn't a religious thing. It was, it was something that I knew that I needed, that if I wanted to impart it to my kids, I could not impart what I didn't have. Now, parenting now becomes overflow of what God's put in you. And a lot of times we get frustrated as parents because the wells run dry. There's no oil in the lamp, and we're burning wick. And so we don't have the, the grace and the strength. And so it, it, was, it was starting first with, with us. Listen to what Proverbs 14, 26 says. He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge. I'm telling you, it is crazy times today, isn't it? I can't imagine the pressure and the stress that students have, children have growing up today when you can't turn on the news and not see a school shooting somewhere in the country. Today more than ever, our children need a refuge. And this is what the, the first biblical principle is. As 
as you as parents have a healthy fear of the Lord, and that fear of the Lord means a respect for the Lord, meaning I need to put him first in my life because it won't work any other way. I need to put him first in my life in my time. I need to put him first in my life in my finances. I need to put God first in my life. And here's what it says. If you do that as parents, it creates a safe refuge for your kids to run home to. Here, here's As dark as things are getting, the brighter the light becomes. I'm telling you, this verse right now screams more and offers more to kids now than at any other time in our history, I would say. It is a great opportunity to stand strong as a parent, is what I'm saying. In darkest times is when the light is the brightest. And so your faith in Christ, your commitment, builds this security and builds a refuge for our children to run and to come and take comfort in. In Proverbs 20, verse 7, it says, The righteous man leads a blameless life. Blessed are the children after him. And so as you begin to deal with your own junk in your life, as you begin to deal with your own stuff, when you begin to say, I've been carrying on bitterness and grudges long enough, you've got to realize that any bitterness, any grudge, any unforgiveness you're carrying, your kids are carrying too. It's a hereditary uh, it's a hereditary illness, in other words. Now, we get this medically, but it, it is, it's spiritually, too. When you go into a doctor's office for the first time, what do they do? They give you a stack of about 40 forms to fill out, right? And it's all family history. Did anybody in your family have diabetes? Did anybody in your family have heart disease? Did anybody in your family have cancer? Why do they want to know if your mom and dad had those things? Because those are hereditary traits that the doctor needs to know physically could genetically be in your body. Spiritually is the same thing. And it says that as you walk blameless, meaning you walk in the righteousness of Christ. It doesn't mean you have to, you're never going to be perfect. But as you walk with Christ, you take on the righteousness of Christ. And it says, blessed are your children, meaning until you're willing to deal with the junk in your life, your kids are going to carry some of it too. And it's only by the grace of God, it's only by his principles that we learn to forgive. We, we learn to let go of things. And that's not bad. We are halfway through principle one. <laughs> Having too much fun with you guys. That's the problem. Okay, I'm going to show this statistic real quick. And, uh, well, I'm going to land the plane here. Um, here's a statistic. Kids who become active Christ followers as an adult. It says, if mom and dad went to church... 72% of all the adult kids will too, 72%. So almost three quarters of the ones um, will go to church. If dad only went to church, 55% of the kids will as adults. If only mom go to church, it drops down to 15%. That's the impact of the father in the home. Now, I did say that if you're a single parent, if you are committed, 50% of the kids will go. This is like a married couple, and the father goes, I want nothing to do with religion, and the mom's going to be the spiritual leader. And I'm going to show you the next point that you might have to wait till next week to hear of why that's important. So if you're a single parent, don't be freaking out right now. you got a 50% chance. You make Jesus uh, a priority in your life, your kids are going to come out. Your kids are going to come out good. Because whatever you put in them, if it's the word of God, what you put in them, God is faithful, and they will not depart from it when they get old. But it's only 15% if only the mom goes to church, and if neither the mom nor the dad, only 6% of the kids when they grow up will find a, a life in Christ and be faithful. It is a priority, and the first principle is this, it starts at the top. Okay. Okay. I'm making a mental call right here. This next one, good. I've got to save it for next week. I've got to save it for next week. All right, we're going to save it for next week. It's so good, but I don't want to rush it. I don't want to rush it. I want to welcome everybody to a 15-part parenting series that we've just started on. <laughs> Now, I'm actually, I'm going to let you slide out early here, in fact, because I don't want to start this next point, but I will say this, um, parenting is our passion. It, it is, uh, our, our family 
has influenced and won more people to Christ than I think anything else in my life. Anything I could have said or could have preached, I'm telling you, you can't fake family. And so we're passionate about this. And here's where I want to give you hope as a parent. And, and if you know somebody, uh, I, I want to give you hope because I'm telling you, you're a good parent. And if you're struggling, you're just trying to find the right principles. Jesus hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They, they don't know. They don't know. And, and I firmly believe in general, in most cases, there, there's no bad parents. There's just parents that just don't know. And so this is, going to be a, this is going to be a series where you, I can guarantee you, you're going to be encouraged. We're going to give you aha moments. And for you grandparents out there, this is going to be good stuff for you too. I'm with you. Uh, the, the, the great, you thought raising kids were great. Uh, grandparenting is even better. And I like the old saying, grandkids are a reward for not killing your kids when they were teenagers. <laughs> so I'm learning that that is true. <laughs> That's just, don't, don't, don't kill them. You want their grandkids, man. They're, that's where life is at. So, but, but we're, we're going to show you how. We're going to show you how. You have great kids. You really have great kids. And I'm telling you, the students here at this church, they're, they're amazing. And so if you have a friend, I want to encourage you to invite them because we're just going to give you the biblical principles. And, and parents just don't know. They just don't know. And we're going to equip you. And it's, I tell you, it is going to be one of the highlights of your life. You are going to be richly blessed. I can assure you of that. Let me pray for you, okay? You know, the first point, I'm glad we got into the first point because it, it begins with you. you. You've got to get your heart right with God because God has a purpose and a plan for each of your kids. But he's got to get a hold of your heart first. And if he gets a hold of your heart, he begins to show you things in your life that just spill out and, and, and they splash on your kids. And it leads and guides that that you, it, it begins with you first. And there's one question that every heart needs to have answered, and the question is this, is my heart right with God? And when you hear this question, if you're sitting there going, I hope so or I think so, today you can know for sure. You might be saying, I try to be a good person. I try to do the right thing. But trying harder doesn't make you right with God. The Bible says in Romans, those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And what that verse means is there's got to be a moment in our lives where we weren't just trying hard to be a good person. But there's got to be a moment when we surrendered ourselves and said, Jesus, come into my life. I'm yours. When we realize we have to be rescued and we call upon his name and we surrender our life to him. And if you don't have a moment like that, this is your moment right now. Maybe you're sitting there and you're going, I'm far from God. Include me in that prayer. I'm going to pray for those that don't know if their heart's right with God or for those that are far from God and are ready to call on him and invite him into their life as Lord and Savior. And if you want to be included in that prayer, if that describes you on a count of three, I'm going to ask you to just simply raise your hand. To raise your hand and say, that, that's me. Include me in that prayer. I, I don't know if my heart's right with God, but today I want to know on a count of three, one, two, Get ready. Three, just lift your hand. Include me in that prayer. Thank you. I see that hand over there. I see that hand right there. Keep your hand raised. It's going to begin with you. This is the first step. Good. And they're going to give you some information. Is there another hand? Right, right up here in the front. There's two. Is there another one? Include me in that prayer. It's going to begin with you, and God is going to use you to change the world around you. But you've got to call on his name. It's not enough to just believe in him, but you've got to call on him. Anybody else say, include me in that prayer. If you're, in the if you're in the connect room or online, if you're in the connect room, I want you to raise your hand. We have a pastor in there that can give you that information. But if you raised your hand or you meant to, I want you to just pray this prayer out loud. It says first in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, it says you will be saved. What a beautiful promise that is. Because what he's saying is he's not waiting for you to get good enough to accept you, that if you'll just surrender to him, he is waiting. And that's what we're going to do. And so if you just, church, pray with me, and just pray, oh, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I believe you died on the cross, that you rose again, and you're seated on the throne. Jesus, 
Forgive me for all that I've done wrong. And I choose to forgive all others. Come into my life today and forever. I am yours in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you.